This is a show about getting spooked for fun, and neither one of the hosts are associated with the attractions discussed in any way. Except for those skeletons in Devin's closet. Some topics may go from ghoulish to ghastly, so viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to The Great American Scream. There's a light Over at the on the podcast. I was going to, okay. What I was going to come in with is telling that our listeners that I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Ooh, How strange nice. was it is the callback that you would do. But um, yeah, Can go I ahead. do another one? I'll do another one. Ready? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so and I'm so pleased that Richard stream. O'Brien on today's episode. <laughs> Richard O'Brien, <laughs> famous for Riff Raff, but arguably more famous for uh, voicing Phineas and Ferb's dad. Yeah, a very powerful resume. Uh, but anyway, hi, welcome to the Great American Scream. My name is Devin Wright. My name is Adam O'Connell, and we would like to continue our discussion on horror and pride, as we did not last week, but the le- week before, at the beginning of June. We mentioned that we would be remiss if we talked about queerness and horror without talking about the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And so why don't we do that? Yeah. In fact, we said that we could do a whole episode on it. And in fact, that was exactly our plan. You've fallen into our trap. (laughs) It's a classic blunder. We fooled you. But um, so we're going to talk about the film specifically. Uh, We'll talk a little about the stage show, too, but specifically the film, its cult status and its relationship to both the queer community and the horror community. Yes. And just kind of a disclaimer that this is a Transylvanian community and the Transylvania. Interestingly enough, um, this is another film, as are most of the films that we talked about in the Horror and Pride episode, that is divisive amongst the queer community, especially in the trans yes. community. Um, and I, as a trans person, can recognize that. Um, so, again, a disclaimer, these are our own personal opinions about the movie. Uh, we barely have authority to do really anything, much less speak yeah, for any, anything. others. <laughs> so We haven't had authority to do this podcast, and yet here we are in episode 19. Exactly. So we'll just be sharing our own personal opinions on the film and then objectively the history of it um, and how it shifted both uh, how it shifted queer culture specifically. Um, and we'll also be spoiling the movie. So we encourage you to uh, go out, watch the movie at home right now or kind of once uh, we can all go back to movie theaters again. Go yeah. uh, and uh, go see your local shadow cast do it. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the episode with a very exciting guest. But for now. Yeah. And it's also I have another one. Um, it's also rated R. So that's why this episode is explicit uh, is because we will be uh, we won't be cussing. But in our interview later, there are some cusses. <laughs> and so we're going to mark it explicit. Yeah. It's, and so if you're this is a naughty watching, movie, so let them listen, but sit with them and listen and enjoy it with them. Yeah. Um, so let's let's roll back the the pickup truck because we've gone full speed ahead onto the highway the without, truck. <laughs> which is the last thing you should be. Well, no, because Frank drives a truck is what it says okay. in this in the lyrics. But I digress. Uh, let's, let's take out our tape of Nixon resigning. Yeah, pop it in the tape player and back up because you might be wondering what is the Rocky Horror Show. So we are talking about two different things here. Technically, the Rocky yeah. Horror Show that title in quotes is a stage musical uh, with book music and lyrics by Richard O'Brien that originally premiered on London's West End in 1973. Now the Rocky Horror Picture Show which is probably what you are more familiar with is the Mm -hmm. 1975 movie based on the stage musical directed by Jim Sharman starring Tim Curry and much of the same cast as the stage musical. They are virtually the same plot uh, with a couple of like little differences cuts songs added scenes but they're pretty much the same plot and most productions of the uh, stage musical have followed the film version more closely Mm -hmm. but they're pretty much the same and uh, if you don't know here's a quick summary 
Uh, it follows the story follows Brad and Janet, two clean cut, virginal, recently engaged ingenues whose car breaks down near a large gothic castle. When they go in for help, they meet a colorful cast of characters, including the handyman, which I don't know why he's called a handyman. Because, yeah, he doesn't do much handymaning. Um, uh, the handyman riffraff, the domestic Hair. magenta, the groupie Columbia, ex-delivery boy Eddie. The So-called because t- he's dead. The, the, he's- the titular Rocky Horror. And of course, the scientist and master of the house, the pansexual transvestite Dr. Frankenfurter. Famously played by Tim Curry. And I also want to note that when we use the word transvestite, we were specifically referring to the 1970s language that referred to a a person dressing up in clothes of the other gender. That's what they define him as in the movie. And it's how we'll be defining him in this discussion. Different interpretations of the film, different versions of the musical um, have gendered him different ways. But this is kind of how he's gendered in the movie. In the movie, right. So throughout the film, Brad and Janet explore their heavily repressed sexualities and indulge in the absolute pleasures of hedonism yes. before discovering that the inhabitants of this house are actually aliens from the planet Transvestite mm-hmm. in the galaxy of Transylvania. Brad and Janet barely escape with their lives and move towards an uncertain future, unsure of how to face the world with these new discoveries about themselves. Yeah, you did it. <laughs> I did it. You you talked about the movie. All right, this has been <laughs> yeah. the Great American Dream. <laughs> so uh, it w- it is meant to be a affectionate parody of the science fiction and horror B movies of the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. It contains many tropes and direct references to such movies, including the opening number, which is basically just listing them. Yeah. Yep. It was when it was released in theaters. It was pretty pretty heavily panned by critics. I think partly. It due to it being both ahead of its time and yeah. such a product of its time, like at right. the same time. It, like when watching it, I always think that it was like an, an 80s movie, if that makes sense. Like it, yeah. it just kind of feels like an 80s movie. Well, but it interestingly a about it movie. a lot, but uh, because it was this movie was really big in the punk scene, the costumes in it did kind of directly influence the yeah. 80s, like New York City punk look with the fishnets and the dyed hair and the dark eyes. Like a lot of that came from Rocky Horror. But it became a midnight movie in uh, 1976 in New York City. We'll talk more about that later. And since then, it's gained a massive cult status. It's considered to be one of the greatest movie musicals of all time. It's one of my personal just favorite movies of all time. Uh, It had a massive influence on queer culture in the late 70s and 80s, especially in New York City, and was preserved uh, by the Library of Congress in the National Film Registry in 2005, which means it is a culturally significant movie. Yes, that's what that means. Yes. And uh, in 2016, Fox remade it. But um, yeah. this is my opinion. It was capital B bad. Uh, so we're not really going to talk about it. Uh, the reasons I don't like it is they straight washed it. The music arrangements were really terrible and they made it PG-13. So it was kind of the Glee version of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Which also which is exists. Funny. Yeah, because that already happened. So it's kind of like they did it. But again, and on a bigger scale. But I did think Adam Lambert and Laverne Cox did a great job in it. But yes, the rest of it I didn't enjoy. But so let's go back and talk about the film itself. Now, Rocky Horror is not typically what you would think of as a horror movie, especially since it's a musical. Yeah, which I do think is a is an unplumbed depth. Horror musicals definitely can work. I'm sad that we haven't we haven't gotten many of them, but there's like Sweeney Todd. American Psycho. Yeah, but again, like even American Psycho. American Psycho is based on a horror movie. But yeah, it's not American a scary Psycho is the closest thing. Well, did you see it? I I've I didn't see it in person. Um, American Psycho, uh, I saw twice on Broadway, and that is the most scared I have been while watching yeah. a musical. It was the closest I felt like to seeing a horror movie. But again, not an original concept based on a movie. Right. So the the reason that it kind of falls in this horror genre, even though it's not really a horror movie, is that it does pay homage to these B-movie films that shaped the horror genre as we knew it today, especially in the 70s and 80s. So movies like The Invisible Man, The Day the Earth Stood Still, Forbidden Planet, The Day the Triffids. And if we named every single one, we would literally, that would be the whole episode. So yeah, and definitely like half of its whole aesthetic is horror film. Mm -hmm. Like, and a lot of the, not that they're, in my opinion, is much of a narrative structure of the film, but what narrative structure there is a lot of it is pretty traceable to like a horror film like right. the idea oh we flat, we got a flat tire we're trapped out here it's raining let's go see the let's go to this mansion and you expect it yeah. to be 
a slasher man in there, but actually it's... I mean, it's he is a slasher man, but he in a, a way man. you would not expect. Yeah, yeah. So there's plenty of scenes of genuine gore and things that would kind of be treated as horror in this movie. Um, most notably, the murder of Eddie at the yes. end of Hot Patootie, which is the song that he sings. Uh, Frank bloodily hacks him to death with a pickaxe, uh, only yep. to have... Magenta and Riff Raff serve his corpse for dinner later that evening. And right. in any other movie, that would be a genuine scene of shock and horror. Oh, yeah. But in this, it's Tim Curry running at the camera and like slightly waving a pickaxe. And then it cuts at to meatloaf. him <laughs> at meatloaf. That's important. And then it cuts to him afterwards. And he has blood on his hands and on the handle of the pickaxe, but no blood on the pickaxe. <laughs> As if to say that Tim Curry both hands in the center of the pickaxe, shoved his hands through meatloaf and came back out, but didn't get the head of his pickaxe bloody at all, which is impressive. At the din- So like later on at the dinner party, Frank will pulls back the tablecloth to reveal Eddie's partially eaten corpse. And it's right. so obviously fake. Like it doesn't look oh, anything so like a good. person, but like it's supposed to be. It's, it, or it's right. at least kind of supposed to be. It, it's an homage to those B movies that didn't have the right. budget to make a big sh- like realistic gore realistic horror like yeah, this is what a, b movies look like yeah and in a horror movie in in any other horror movie that scene would be set up beautifully because it has that like long sequence yeah. of of frankenfurter cutting the meat and it takes way too long and everybody is very silent and then it goes into it's like texas chainsaw massacre yeah and it's it, it's set up like a horror thing but because it's rocky horror it is so not that yeah just yeah um, and side note on that, this movie was made on a shoestring budget. Um, yeah. It cost one point four million to make. And for comparison, uh, Jaws came out the same year as this movie and the budget for Jaws was nine million dollars. Yeah. Now, I feel like a lot of that probably went to the shark. But regardless, um, right. this movie had a tiny budget is my point. But then the cheap effects like play in this movie's favor. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. It like does. it was already outdated for its time. So it's not like you can look back on it and go, oh, like the special effects are so outdated. They were already right. outdated. They were already outdated. So one point nine million dollars in 1975 would be about nine million dollars today. OK, which is um, like that is nothing. No, for, you can't make a, a movie, movie with that has as much dollars. as this does, especially when I was talking about the special effects a little bit uh, while I was watching it. And a lot of them are actually pretty impressive. Like the it doesn't seem like the lips at the beginning of the movie are actual lips or well, else they, they are, are. They are someone's lips. That That the, is a recording. The teeth are definitely real. But no, the lips are real. I The lips seem to be what I think they did is they painted. They had green on them or they keyed them out and then like okay. repainted them over, which is an impressive thing to do. The like ending scene where the when the, the mansion gets like. Like, like lifts off like a rocket ship. And it's like the very bad effects in it. They're like not actually that bad of effects. Like <laughs> it is surprising. Yeah. Um, but interestingly about this is a side note about the lips that they are Patricia Quinn's lips who played Magenta. But uh, Richard O'Brien, Riff Raff and mm-hmm. the writer is singing. And when she found out that she was just lip syncing it, she almost quit the movie. But he convinced oh. her to stay back in. That's very, very good. And like on on that same like effects note, the. What frustrated me so much, so this is the first time I've ever seen Rocky Horror, and I really enjoyed it. I really loved it from start to finish. Truly, truly I did. We had, my boyfriend and I watched it, and we had Adam (laughs) on FaceTime in between us on the couch uh, so that he could do call-outs. And it, what was frustrating to me is that it is such a fun movie, it's such a silly movie, and it like has the look of a quote-unquote bad movie, but so much of the filmmaking is actually really good. So much like hidden effects, hidden match cuts, hidden like film technique that it's like you're watching this and it's like Rocky Horror. Devin, Devin could not get over the bedroom scenes where um, it's Frank disguised as Brad and Janet respectively. And like he comes in and then they pull the wig off. (laughs) They are incredible. I think they're match cuts. I think they are literally. I mean, what else could they? They have to be like what else hidden cuts. Yeah. The other option is that you actually just had Tim Curry dressed as. As but the silhouettes are too good. Right, right, right. Like, and I made the joke about that set, which we can talk about. The like, one of the call outs is what, what cheap ass uh, movie, uh, same it's, room. It's same room, different light, cheap movie. Yeah. Like they obviously are a shoestring budget movie, but they, 
that bedroom set design is so good for the kind of effects you're going to do. Like, it's it's just so well thought out, which, again, is like, how dare you, Rocky Horror? How dare you? <laughs> So what I think it really does interesting with this kind of like 50s B movie is they could have just made a direct parody of 50s B movies. But because of uh, Richard O'Brien's like queerness and the way that he approached this movie uh, is that uh, they turn the genre on his head by changing who we treat as the heroes of the story, regardless Mm -hmm. if it's a parody or satire or not. Um, So Brad and Janet are literally billed as a hero and a heroine. um, But the most famous, one of the most famous advertising posters for this film depicts Frankenfurter with the tagline, he's the hero. That's right. The hero. And I think I can safely say that like 90% of the people who are watching the movie are like, not like rooting, rooting for Frank, but like you want Frank yeah. to do stuff. Like, I don't think anyone's watching the movie going like, oh, I hope Brad and Janet like get their car get fixed out. and make it out of there. Yeah. Like you want like, them nothing- to stay and... Yeah, and I think today especially, that's pretty clear. I could see the argument of like, oh, maybe people didn't see Frankenfurter as the protagonist in the 70s, but like, there's no real argument for any other character being the protagonist. And and there's so much like talk about movies today and people don't understand that the protagonist doesn't have to be the good guy or whatever. Mm-hmm. But like, yes, Frankenfurter kills yeah. multiple people. Frankenfurter also- kills, he commits sexual assault. Like, Frankenfurter yeah. is not a good yeah, person. Yeah, and actually... We could have a whole episode about the. I mean, there could be a thesis written about the the those scenes where Frankenfurter uh, has sexual relations with both Janet and Brad, and how mm-hmm. they like for the seventies. They have a very like it is a very complex uh, depiction of mm-hmm. of the lack of consent or presence of consent. It's a very interesting scene, but we won't because that's not what the podcast is about. But like Frankenfurter is the protagonist. He has yeah. the like saddest, most again. How dare Rocky Horror make me so sad during the that, I'm going home I'm going song. home. Beautiful. And and then I was pissed when he died. Like I was <laughs> so angry. Like for me to walk into this movie and be like, oh, I'm going to like Frankenfurter is the protagonist. I'm like rooting for him, whatever. And then he dies. And the, like the movie ends after that. Like I'm, I was so upset. Like how dare this movie kill Frankenfurter. But yeah. like also he was a murderer. Right. Like, <laughs> um, and the, the the film frames itself in a way that a sci-fi B movie in the fifties would that we should react with shock and horror at the aliens and root for the pure heroes to win, but it also knows that the audience is hoping for the opposite. Not that we right. want Brad and Janet to like die or get hurt, but we want them to like join the dark side, as it will. Right, and I I made a joke, and I'm this is where I'm going to take over the podcast before we talk about. <laughs> its relation to like lgbt culture Mm -hmm. i need to take over the podcast for a minute and talk about why i think that this movie is uh a metaphor for the i was gonna put an an embargo on you talking about this because you get 45 seconds (laughs) again rocky horror has no right to to be this like thematically interesting and everything but when we look at like the presence of aliens like the presence of multiple different antagonists and having the audience having having so much uh knowledge of like what the audience is going to think about these different characters there is definitely a reading of this movie wherein the brad and janet represent the kind of moderate people i see it as 20s germany it could also be today in the u.s it's an interesting thing but you could have brad and janet be the moderate germans and have frankenfurter and his whole house kind of represent the like the the perception of the avant-garde in germany being like these scary trans and gay people and they're like carving a community for themselves and making interesting art and then to have the fbi the professor be this like fbi agent investigating and like saying that this like hedonism is inherently bad and alien to like all of society and then other aliens come in and say like that's not right you're like we're gonna like you've done something wrong frankenfurter you have to we're going to kill you for some reason. There's just guys I could write an essay about it. I'm not going the, to. And I understand I need to give the podcast back. My time is up, but I will take my answer off the air. Thank the you. the only thing I will give you is that Tim Curry originally played Frankenfurter with a German accent. That is all I will give you. The professor is German, too. Well, yeah, the professor is German, too. Yes, but uh, Frankenfurter he was originally played the with a German accent. the oncoming Nazi threat. Anyway, 
Um, and, let's and cultural t- conservatism. Let's talk about it as a moment in queer culture, which is kind of what it's more known for rather than its relationship to the horror community. And for its relationship to the Weimar Republic. But hopefully I can change that. <laughs> so Richard O'Brien, who wrote it and also plays Riff Raff, uh, said he was primarily inspired by the glam rock movement in England in the 1970s and saying that it allowed him to be more himself and we can obviously see that in the film's message, which is don't dream it, be it like right. be what you like really like animalistically want to be inside. And like it said, the film critically tanked, notably right. in the U.S., where it was I mean, it was the 70s. It was the counterculture movement. But we were moving right. towards the 80s. Things were kind of starting to. Yeah. The, the time that this movie came out, especially in the U.S., like it is in the middle of a big conservative swing Mm -hmm. especially culturally yeah uh and then the political would follow but like yeah but so in 1976 uh, in 1976 in where else but new york city the uh waverly theater which is now known as the ifc center which is just off washington square park which i know i lived there for like a whole year and had no idea that used to be the waverly theater yeah right by the mcdonald's and the basketball court um but so it started airing the movie as a midnight movie um now the midnight movie phenomena was when tv stations and theaters started to air offbeat and non-mainstream news uh movies or ones that were considered like too scandalous for Mm -hmm. daytime uh, airing. A notable example is Freaks from 1932. Which you would know because it is where the meme one of us, one of us comes from. Exactly. Um, It's usually with a narrator doing comedic asides to kind of break the the tension. Mm -hmm. And it was also a way to encourage repeat viewings and escalating these films to cult status. Like people would go and see it over and over again to hear different narrators, funny things. Yeah. Um, so people started seeing Rocky at midnight over and over again and eventually started yelling funny responses back at the character dialogue because there's a lot of weird pauses oh, and so- questions that kind of lend themselves to answering what's on screen. Yeah. And that evolved into people started coming dressed as their favorite characters and singing along to the dialogue. Um, and this eventually led to the first shadow cast. And if you don't know, a shadow cast is a cast of performers that perform usually a cult movie, stuff like Rocky Horror. Um, some do Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Some do Repo, a genic opera. But uh, they perform alongside the movie being played by doing the same things to the characters, lip syncing the songs, dancing and everything. Um, and the first shadow cast in New York was uh, formed by school teacher Sal Piero, who eventually became president of the official international fan club and i think he actually had a cameo in the 2016 fox uh remake because of that which is nice for him and um yeah. dory hartley was the other founder of the shadow cast and uh, by the end of 1979 over 200 theaters in the country 230 theaters in the country were doing bi-weekly showings of this wow. movie with or without shadow casts. and there are still theaters doing that today yes which is um, wild yeah, so the traditions at midnight showings include callbacks. So like we said, uh, responding to the dialogue on the screen, the most notable example being whenever Brad says his name uh, I like or introduces himself as Brad Majors, you yell back asshole. Mm-hmm. And whenever uh, Janet says her name, you yell back slut. Because her journey is a, a realization of, of sexual uh, awakening. Liberation. And, yeah, and liberation. Yeah, and liberation, yeah. Dressing up as either your favorite characters or just inspired by the movie or just kind of dressing how you want. Yeah. I also want to mention there are other call outs that are probably known as well, such as a toast and then people throw toast at the screen. Yes. The it, Do you throw rice at, in the beginning? Uh, in the wedding, Some you're people. supposed to throw rice. A lot of theaters don't let you do that, though, because it's, it's a pain a, in the ass to clean, clean up. up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, there are props uh, yeah. to like when uh, during there's a light when Janet gets out of her car and holds the newspaper over her head, you right. hold your newspaper over your head. And traditionally, the shadow cast will then spray you with water guns. Yeah, and, and OK, I have a, I love this movie very much. I love it yeah. so much. We are both people who uh, went to have bachelor degrees in theater. <laughs> yeah. Have have done a lot of theater studies work and and also are big fans of musicals. None of. This movie is it doesn't it earns all these all the songs. It earns them all in terms of like my buy in to them. Right. Like I'm so into it. But there's a light makes legitimately no sense. Dramatically <laughs> it's one of my favorite in the songs movie. in the movie. too. I love it. It's so much fun because it's so silly. It makes no sense that these two people 
who have just gotten a flat tire and no, we saw a castle a few miles back. Let's walk there. Castles don't have phones, asshole, is the callback for that. Of course. And Janet says, I have to come along with you. What if there's some hot woman, woman in there? Owns the castle? And they start singing as though I, the thing that I said last night, and it holds it, I, I think this is right. It is as if they are two people stuck underground for 20 years and they've just seen their first peak of daylight. But like, like metaphorically, aren't they? But it, they have no reason to believe that that is the moment <laughs> happening. Like, obviously, that's what happens, right? Like, they, that, that the light that they see is not only the mansion, it's also this, like, idea of, again, sexual liberation and, and discovery of the hedonistic practices of this mansion. But, like, at that point in the story, why? It doesn't make any <laughs> sense. And it's so, they're so earnest. They're so earnest. Uh, but like I was saying, and, and one thing about dressing up too for these shows is that people come dressed as the characters or they just kind of come dressed in whatever makes them yeah. feel good, feel feel sexy, suit. feel confident, feel yeah. whatever they want. Um, and that is kind of the, the basis of why these shows became a haven for the for the queer community, especially in the 70s and 80s, as the film celebrates sexual liberation and queer identity and androgyny. Um, both shadow cast performers and audience members alike found the opportunity to express themselves exactly how they wanted, however femme they wanted, however butch they wanted, like right. in whatever way made them feel confident. Um, they could celebrate love and queer sex and express their gender in literally any way they pleased. Um, and it was a way for the people kind of on the fringes of society to find community. And you would see people on the streets at night in the 70s and 80s going to Rocky Horror screenings and fishnets and heels of all genders and walks of life. And yeah, it, it, it harbored community very well in that way. Yeah. And we can talk about today, uh, like as we mentioned in the beginning, that there is, you know, a, a debate and a nuance in this discussion about about how important it is today mm -hmm. uh, to the LGBT community. But as we talked about in the Pride episode a few weeks back, the sh just the presence of a character like Frankenfurter however you would analyze him today, the presence of a character like Frankenfurter on a screen in 1975 was itself kind of radical and, and again, earnest in a way that I don't think many audiences, especially LGBT audiences, would have seen in 1975. Yeah, and the, the line that always hits me is in The Floor Show when Frank makes his appearance and he sings Whatever Happened to uh, Faye Ray, that delicate like satin drip frame, uh, and like I would I don't remember what the line is, but like I would watch her and I'd start to cry because I wanted to be dressed just the same. Like, yeah, there are so many young queer people out there who can identify with that feeling exactly. And that, right. as I think, is at the core of Frank's character. Um, and yeah. I know I personally have found huge community as a queer person from Rocky Horror Midnight Screenings. Uh, it's where I've met a lot of my very dear friends. It's a favorite Halloween tradition of mine. I try and go every Halloween season when I can. Uh, I went last Halloween on Halloween night. I managed to get tickets. I went as Riff Raff and it was really fun. And uh, it blends all of my personal favorite things as well, which is horror, musicals, rock and roll and being gay. Like those yeah, are yeah. the four like into one which was very, another very famous Rocky Horror Picture Show poster. It just said those four things. Yeah, <laughs> that was the poster. Um, but so kind of speaking on that specifically, we are going to cut to uh, talking to a very special guest who is uh, the director of the NYC Rock, the director at large, rather, of the NYC Rocky Horror Picture Show Shadowcast um, to kind of talk a little bit more about Rocky Horror in 2020 and what to expect when you go and see uh, a live show. Yeah, we're going to jump to that right now, and we're going to give you like a Wayne's World. I'm going to go... Doodle -doodle 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 -doodle. Alrighty, welcome back, everybody, from our brief musical interlude. I hope everybody got like a little potty break. Yeah, I hope you didn't get <laughs> Maybe lost. you got some ice cream. Yeah. We are back for the second part of our discussion with a, a very special... Special guest to talk more about uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Very special guest. Would you like to introduce yourself? No, absolutely not. All right. This has been the <laughs> yeah. Great American Screen. I'm but a ghost. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's up, y'all? Uh, my name is John Salamak. Uh, you would call me John, of course. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I am a uh, director at large for the New York City Rocky Horror Picture Show Shadowcast. Woo! Fun. Which I uh, mentioned earlier as... My favorite shadow cast wow. and a place I have frequented many times in uh, 
in New York. Um, and so we talked uh, in the first part of our discussion about the history of Shadowcast, kind of how they came to be, how callbacks started and stuff like that. And the film's like cult status. But we didn't really talk too much about the 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 2020 Shadowcast experience. Um, so uh, what can you sort of paint us, a, weave us a rich tapestry of what um, a night at NYC Rocky uh, looks like? Sure. So I'll bring it from the perspective of somebody who has never seen a Shadowcast before someone who is branded a virgin by the Rocky Horror community. So, oh, really, you are? Yeah, I yeah, watched Devin's it for the first never. time last night. Like, There's no, <laughs> there's no worries about that. Yeah. <laughs> no worries at all. The first time I actually ever saw it, I was a virgin, too. Uh, I saw the Rocky Horror Picture Show live shadow cast maybe about seven or eight months before I actually joined the cast. So wow. specifically with the New York City shadow cast, what will happen is you show up to Sinaipolis, Chelsea, which is where we are currently stationed. We've been there for a good chunk of time. You show up 1130, 1145. Eventually, the theater ushers will line you up. They'll give you the, the rundown. They'll talk about that it's an R-rated movie. If you're underage, you need ID. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Eventually, when we give them the go that we are ready inside of our theater, they will bring them down to whatever theater we're in. There's nine theaters in the Sinaipolis Chelsea. So whichever one they're at, they'll let you know. And then you go up there and you'll form another line. And when you're standing in that line, you'll be accosted by our, typically by our props people and by our co-host. They'll talk about prop bags. They'll talk about who has never seen the show before. And if it is okay to mark you as somebody who has ever seen the show before, usually we do that with lipstick and it's usually on the forehead or the cheek or like right on the chest, whatever the audience member is comfortable with, with a giant V, which stands for virgin. So everyone will wait in line for about 10 to 15 minutes. Depends on how fast we are in getting everything ready inside with our sound and our light set up. Eventually, once we are all ready, once people have bought prop bags or shirts or pins, buttons, etc., our co-host of the evening will come out and yell at the audience, which usually gets a very negative reaction from people who are in the theater who are currently watching movies. We've had many people <laughs> yeah. yell at us while doing it. Just to get everyone excited and pumped up. Eventually, we will give them a brief little rundown before they come in. We'll welcome them in. They'll be, we'll be playing music. It's a really cool, chill environment. Depending on the season, you can sit wherever you want. Uh, during our slow seasons, so these are times like what would be right now, the beginning of the winter, things like that. You're allowed to sit anywhere in the theater aside from, you know, on the floor or the first row. We call that first row the splash zone, which <laughs> essentially it doesn't mean anything necessarily gross. But what it means <laughs> is that that's the area where we put a lot of our props and that's where some of our cast members will sit. And either do callbacks, record video, take pictures, or some of the actual active performing cast that night will sit and wait for their cues from there. If we have a full house, then we'll usually just kind of like chill on the ground right in front of them. Duck because down. our yeah. yeah, our theater is <laughs> super small depending on where we are. And full house season is typically like Halloween or kind of those or some of your theme uh, weekends and stuff. Yeah, Halloween. So basically all of October... And for the good first half of November are usually our sold out shows and typically our themed nights that we talk about in advance, like we post them on social media, Instagram, stuff like that. Those are far uh, usually uh, oversold. So basically, once everyone is seated, the co-hosts will tell them about callbacks. They'll tell them about what to expect in terms of the show. So these are things like talking about how to use your prop bags. So in our prop bags, we have four different items. Casts differ what is in their prop bags based on their location. But from what we do is dependent on what the theater likes from us. So we do toast, we do gloves, we do playing cards, and we do newspaper. So we tell everyone how to use them, when to use them. And then the co-host will then bring the host down. And then the host goes through what is called Virgin Sacrifice. So I can't really yeah. go into too much detail as to what Virgin Sacrifice mm -hmm. is because, A, it's different for every cast, and, right. B, it leaves a surprise. Yeah. But and essentially, we, you're not allowed to talk about it. Right, yes. Our, <laughs> yeah, our, our, our legal uh, counsel prevents me from speaking of <laughs> yeah. that outside of the theater. But essentially, we welcome 
in the greatest sense of the word, the virgins to the Rocky Horror community. So that takes anywhere from 10 to 25, 30 minutes. And then after that, the show gets started. Amazing. And I, just as like a, a personal experience from virgin sacrifices, they're usually some kind of scandalous mini game or competition. Um, I know the first time I brought my best friend to the shadow cast, um, the uh, virgin sacrifice, which she volunteered to go up for, involved faking an orgasm, as I think a lot of different ones do. And uh, she's a trained singer. So when she got up there, she hit like a high A and then went, I'm a lesbian, so I've never had to fake an orgasm. And she didn't win. That's I was tragic. furious. Um, it was audience vote, but I was furious. Yeah, I am getting a, I'm getting a nod from our from our lawyer over there that that is that's the extent of what you're allowed to talk about. So you're good. That's all we're we good? can say. OK, OK. okay. Basically Thank you, that. Carlson. We do a lot of different types of uh, virgin sacrifices. That is the most popular one that NYC does. But since mm. it's been about maybe about a year and a half, we've kind of expanded that. So we do a lot of different types. It really depends on the host because we all have our different games for the virgin sacrifice. Mm-hmm. So like I, when I host, I don't do that unless there's one reason or another in which I have to. Got it, got it. So... As far as like the the film experience goes, so you are both the director and you are part of the cast, so you fulfill a, a a large variety of roles. Do you have a favorite like track to do? Oh, absolutely. Before I get into that, I also do want to reiterate that NYC has two directors and they have a director at large. So I'm the director at large, which means that I'm not like full on director. I am mm-hmm. part of the leadership that runs NYC, we have two directors who kind of split their responsibilities. So we have director number one is Meg, and she's the one who runs our light crew, and she's also the one who is in charge of casting. And then we also have Eric, who is in charge of things like theater relations. They also help with props they also perform so we kind of all wear many different hats but they're the two main directors and i'm the director at large so essentially that means that i'm responsible for not necessarily the day-to-day running of nyc rhps but i am in charge of things like theme nights pre-shows the website social media very front-facing things. Yeah. Yeah. So the, that's the, the image. Yeah. The director yeah, of the so theater I'm, company, kind of. Exactly. So I kind of really focus on like the image and what the output of Rocky of NYC RHPS is, and then you have Meg and Eric who do a lot of internal things. But I do have a favorite. So I play every single character, including Hell yeah. Trixie, including the criminologist. My first character that I ever played actually was Columbia, but not That's who I want to play. As, That's who I... Not Col- <laughs> <laughs> Columbia's a fantastic character. I actually ended up not necessarily playing Columbia because my first performance ever on stage was during one of our theme nights, which is, happens over the April Fool's weekend called Cast in a Hat, which essentially means that we get casted for the show dressed as a character. And right before hosting begins, we all go up and we pick a character out of the hat. And that's a character that we have to play that night with no notice. So I was dressed as Riff for that (laughs) night and I ended up pulling Columbia. So technically my first performance was Columbia, but the first character I ever played in the costume was Riff. And Riff is still my favorite character by a landslide. Oh, I I think like as far as the film characters go, Riff is my favorite too. We were talking about this last night too. Just, like, the immense, like, power, but also this, like, feral rat energy yeah. that Riff Rap, Riff Rap has going for him at the exact same he time. He looks like the rat. He's, like, his energy is the Rat King from the Nutcracker if the Rat King was yep. an incredibly <laughs> handsome man underneath the rat. Right? I agree. I agree. I love Riff. I love his energy throughout this, the show. And he has the benefit of being a character, at least in the shadow casting thought of the show that he has the biggest song in the show he has one of the most important entrances of the show and he also ends up being if you want to clarify him as such he ends up being the villain yeah too. yeah and yeah and and everything villain, you know? between there is just him vibing so from a shadow casting perspective he has an excellent entrance he has the biggest song in the show he has the crescendo at the end and in the middle he just gets the chill yeah <laughs> god i mean there, there can't be there's no tr- i feel like there's no track in like a rocky horror shadow cast that i would like 
get like to get to do for the night and be like, ah, oh, bummer. Yeah. Like they're all spectacular. Yep. But man, Riff is, and you get some nice costume changes as Riff too, or like the at least the the big one. Yeah. Um. I'm, there's a couple of other great costume changes with various characters, but especially Frank. But anyhow, um, and kind of talking about that too. Do you have? Uh, we talked a little bit about like uh what the popular call outs are the callbacks the audience moments uh do you have any uh favorite ones as both a performer and from an audience perspective oh gosh so i have many i love callbacks they're one of my favorite parts of the show i really love and cherish the times where i'm not casted as a performer because that's a very regular thing nyc rhps performs well obviously not now because of the coronavirus, but when we were performing, mm. we perform every Friday and Saturday at midnight. We're the only cast that does doubles weekly in the United States outside of Halloween. So oh, great. Tr- traditionally, I'm there every Friday and Saturday, and more often than not, I'm performing every Friday and Saturday. So I really cherish the days where I'm off, and maybe I'm just there to host the show, or I'm just there to help with props, because I get to sit in the back and do callbacks, because I think that really adds to the immersive level of what Rocky Horror is and the type of immersive theater that it becomes. Some of my favorites that get me every time during driving scene where Janet goes to say something to Brad, but Brad cuts her off. She kind of looks away and then she opens her mouth. And when she opens her mouth, everyone in the audience screams (laughs) as if like, (laughs) as if she's the one who is screaming. It gets me every time. The greatest part about callback culture though is that it evolves over time so there are some callbacks that are happening now specifically with our cast that don't happen with other casts i went to guest perform with the junior chamber of commerce players which is the cast that's out in pittsburgh and during columbia's tap dance what they do is completely different from what we do yeah so when they do the tap dance they sing the song shake your ass watch yourself shake your ass show me what you're working (laughs) with in in beat to the music And I never knew that. So when I heard that for the first time, I nearly pissed myself. (laughs) It was the funniest thing I've ever seen. Uh, But a lot of my favorite callbacks come from inside jokes. So I have an inside joke with my cast that there was this one night. I was playing like Brad or somebody. It wasn't even anyone that is like a monumentally good character that has a lot of big dick energy. But there was this audience (laughs) member who just loved me. And (laughs) every single time I would come out as Brad, he would start screaming his head off. I have no idea who this man is. To this day. I have no idea. I I still have no idea. He disappeared. This is actually, we knew about it. It's Adam. Adam, could you please tell your story? (laughs) It was me. So. I was a plant. So at the very end of the night, we go out and we do bows in credits order. So the person who plays Frank comes out, bows. Janet comes out, bows. And then when I came out as Brad, this person stood up and started cheering and was like, fuck you. Yeah, good job, Mr. Big Cock. And everyone <laughs> lost it. Whoa, I have no idea wow. where this came from. I did not see this person after the show. To this day, this person ends up being a mystery. But for like a month later, every single time I came out on stage, it didn't matter what character I was. Somebody in the cast would then start calling out about how gigantic my dick was. <laughs> so those were hilarious. I also have an inside joke with... A friend of mine, Zephyr, who is currently on RKO and has been on RKO for, I think, close to a decade now. He has this stupid callback that whenever I perform, doesn't matter who the character is, but the one that is most known for him, at least in our circle of friends, is, hey, Brad, um, Brad, fuck, Brad, um, hey, if you, um, if Brad, Brad, if you could, if you had the fuck, Brad, wh- um, which one is your sister? <laughs> yeah, and it gets me every single time because the whole point so of the show good. is that you're not supposed to be quiet during the movie, and yeah. this part is supposed to be right after time or when Brad says, "Say, do any of you guys know Adam Madison?" And it's supposed to be, "Hey, Brad." say something stupid, mm-hmm. do any of you guys know Adam Madison? But then Zephyr just kind of like pulled it unnecessarily long <laughs> while Brad and Janet are walking up to go meet Frank at the elevator. And it is the funniest thing I think I've <laughs> ever heard. It's so stupid, and I hate that I laugh at it, 
but that is probably my favorite callback of all time. Yeah, that's why I always encourage people to like go see casts more than once and go see different casts because everybody's going to do the show a different way. And if you see the same cast more than once, you're going to start to pick up on like what they do best. Their inside jokes, the your their performers that they use often and like it'll be a different experience, but you'll kind of like learn more and more each time and you'll get good at the call outs yeah. too. Mm-hmm. And uh, so this is also like a primarily like we talk about horror culture on this podcast. Um, and it's kind of interesting that we're doing an uh, episode on Rocky Horror, because even though horror is in the title, it's really not what you would think of as like a horror movie. Right. Do you could do you consider it to be kind of like in the genre? Not necessarily. And the reason why mm-hmm. is because I personally have a vendetta against horror films, which is funny because oh, now I'm God. talking about a horror podcast, right? Yeah, um, it's OK. I'm I there am, with you. I'm there with you. That's the I am, conceit. <laughs> literally I am. I'm the biggest wuss when it comes to horror movies. I've seen a lot of like the regular or the expected ones. Mm-hmm. when I was younger, but then I remember very vividly when I was 10 years old, I was in my bedroom, and I went out to the living room to ask my mom for something, and she was watching The Grudge, the American version, so it's like the shittier version, and mm-hmm. it was the scene where the the protagonist got into bed, and the woman demon thing, she like lifted up her comforter, and the girl was underneath it, and it was like a big jump scare, oh, right, right, right. and I did not expect that, and ever since then I have, like, I can't watch horror movies. If it is branded <laughs> as a horror movie, I'm like, that ain't it, Chief. Yeah. I've I'm seen out. a few <laughs> since since then because of, you know, friends being like, oh, no, it's not that scary, that kind of stuff. But I really don't consider Rocky a horror movie. I think that the reason I think that why it's being called the Rocky Horror Picture Show or the Rocky Horror Show is just because Richard O'Brien's initial envision of the of the movie was supposed to be a satirical look at horror B movies from the golden age of Hollywood. Yeah. Which, right. at the time, because of what they had in terms of special effects, it was horror. But when you watch some of the older movies now, you're like, that's not scary at all because it doesn't look it's realistic. It's pure camp. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think that the horror is kind of, or the horror in the Rocky Horror Picture Show ends up being more of a satirical jab at right. horror and old horror It's tongue-in-cheek yeah. like everything else in Rocky exactly. Horror is. Yeah, it's, it, exactly. They're... There's like not one point during the Rocky Horror Picture Show seeing it where I was like, oh, no, that's scary. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. It feels to me like and we were our episode next week is about like comedy in horror. And mm-hmm. there's like so much connective tissue between like comedy films, horror films and musicals, like specifically in like the campness and and the schlockiness of the acting a lot of the time. And Rocky Horror just seems to sit right in the middle of that like triangle. Agreed. It absolutely does. Yeah. Finally, is kind of like a, a lovely closeout question. Um, we talked a lot about the, the community of the fans and the shadow casts of uh, people who go to these midnight screenings and these shadow casts and kind of what the film has done for people. So you personally, what is your favorite thing about the community of Rocky, both from the performer side and the audience side and kind of like their relationship? Cool. So I can admit it. I have a gigantic ego. I I think I'm hot shit. I really do. I think I'm a great performer, a great person, you know, X, Y, and Z. And Rocky really <laughs> ends up giving you the avenue to channel that in a healthy way because you end up being or putting on this guise of during a show, the audience is forced to pay attention to you because not only are they watching you perform, but they're also watching you perform in directly in their faces. There are parts where, like, for example, when I play Riff, his entrance in There's a Light is in the castle. But when we perform it at the show, I typically hide so that they can't see me. And then I kind of do a little bit of a jump scare from the front row. And I usually jump directly into somebody's face. And it (laughs) always either gets a wild applause, people hitting on me, which happens a lot in the Rocky community. Not me, (laughs) but just in general. or, Or the shit gets scared out of them. So it adds a little bit of a horror element to it. But it's the fact that, like, not only are they paying attention to you, but they're paying attention to you despite all the hectic chaos that's going around them. Whether it's the other people doing callbacks, it's the movie playing behind you, it's the other characters going at each other on stage. It ends up being an area where they are forced to pay attention to you. So that really satisfies a lot of the the ego that comes along (laughs) with being in Rocky Horror. But not even in Rocky, but just in theater in general. 
You know, there are so many aspects of theater that are very egocentric. And Rocky, I think, to an extent, as long as you understand that as much as you love stroking your ego, the most important thing is that you're there to put on a show. It ends up being a really good and healthy way of explaining what ego is and explaining what ego means to you. The community itself is, as you said, is a fantastic community. I moved to New York City. I'm not originally from NYC or New York State for that matter. I'm originally from Philadelphia. And I moved up to New York City knowing next to nobody. And then my girlfriend at the time lived in North Jersey And we would see each other off and on, but eventually when that relationship was over, I knew literally nobody. I moved up here for work. I lived literally at work. I am a higher education administrator by day, so that's actually what I'm taking my break from right now is doing higher ed work, Uh, right? (laughs) So when I originally moved up here, I lived on campus. So I didn't really get to know anybody because work was my life. And then when my girlfriend and I parted ways, I was like, I don't know anybody. And my initial entrance into the Rocky Horror community was uh, my partner, who I ended up meeting, who was a new member on NYC. So she asked me, like, hey, have you ever seen Rocky Horror? And I was like, no. And she was like, oh, you should come. Oh, by the way, here are some clothes that you should wear. And I was like, <laughs> I don't have any shame. So sure, it was like a corset, hot pants, fishnets, heels. And I was like, sure, fine, why? How Whatever. I went there, like, it was myself and a friend of mine who worked at the college that I was working at. And ever since then, I was hooked. The community just seemed so open and so welcoming of any walk of life and I initially did not want to I didn't want to monopolize on that because it is very clearly a queer space like Rocky is an area where people who may not feel like they are accepted by the community at large can go to for acceptance. And I'm here trudging my disgusting straight white ass in here like (laughs) I want to be part of this community. But (laughs) it's my space. now, Right. (laughs) And. I felt very uncomfortable at the beginning because I was like, this is clearly a queer space and I don't want to overstep my boundaries here because I don't want to walk in as a straight man and be like, this is my community because it's not. But the more that I was there and the more that I learned from everybody who I surrounded myself with, the more I realized that it is a queer space. But And my inclusion there shows that it is also a space for everybody as long as they treat that space with respect so yeah, exactly it ended up being it is still primarily 100 percent a queer space and while i do not say that it is my area i feel like as somebody who consistently advocates for the lgbtq community that it's important for that community because it is an area where people can let loose it's an area where people can be their authentic selves regardless of what that means you know you don't have to be gay to be part of rocky you also don't have to be looking like the characters to play rocky you know we have a lot of folks on our on our cast who are plus-sized individuals who perform characters that are you know janet who is thin you know it's an area that and they're also they're beautiful for doing it it's an area where anybody can be accepted it's a place for people who were weird you know who were outcasted by society regardless of what that reason was maybe they were part of the lgbtq community maybe maybe they were bullied maybe they were this maybe they were that it is just an area where everybody can become who they envisioned themselves being you know it's such a wonderful community extremely accepting and you learn a lot about it too like i've always considered myself an ally but i did not know how deep that becomes until I got really involved in the Rocky community at large. I consider myself relatively knowledgeable, but I also understand that I am in no way, shape or form, you know, the end all be all about the community, about any of that. So it's really great because now I'm also part of a community that encourages me and keeps me accountable and makes me keep learning about the different types of communities that eventually fall into Rocky. So not only is it great, a great area for, anyone to come and be accepted into but it's also a great area for for education it's a great area for to consistently learn about different groups of people that you may not have originally been privy to like i grew up in suburban philadelphia you know my father is inherently racist and homophobic and all of that kind of stuff but moving to new york and being a part of nyc really reshapes your 
your thoughts about the identities of different people. Yeah. It is an incredible community. And even people who are just audience members can see that. And I think that that shows how powerful the Rocky community is because not only do I see that as somebody who performs with them every Friday and Saturday, but you can get that that welcoming feeling regardless of if you've seen it for the first time or the millionth time. And that really takes a special group of people to be able to give you that feeling after all you've done is seeing them act out a movie for two hours. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, yeah absolutely. I, I think it's a beautiful space where people can share the spotlight and like everything that you said. And I think that's a, a beautiful note to kind of close out this interview on. But before we go, um, so where, if people who are listening want to find out more about your show, uh, like what social media, where can we, where can we yeah, find your stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So, so like I said, we perform, well, not right now because of coronavirus, but once <clears throat> we are allowed back into that theater, we perform, as of right now, every Friday and Saturday at midnight. During the Halloween season, we obviously have many more shows, but traditionally, Friday and Saturday at midnight. You can find all the information on our website, which is nycrhps.org, which, of course, stands for orgasm. That you can <laughs> find You can find uh, pictures and bios of all of our performers and who they play. You can find out about upcoming theme nights upcoming special things that we are doing as a cast you can buy your tickets there tickets typically go on sale the tuesday before the show that you would be wanting so for example if you wanted to go to the show this weekend the tickets would have been on sale two days ago well because it's thursday now so they go on sale about tuesday we also have social media we have a facebook page which is obviously nyc rhps we have a Twitter account, which is, again, at NYCRHPS. We have an Instagram account that is also NYCRHPS. <laughs> and we also make the joke that we have a Tinder, we have a Grinder, we have a Farmers Only, we have an Ashley Madison, we have a Seeking Arrangements, we have a fully maxed RuneScape account, we have a Neopets account. We've got, <laughs> you know, every single social media account that you can possibly think of, we probably have it, and it's at NYCRHPS. Awesome. And any of your personal stuff that you want to plug? If people oh, yeah, want to sure. find out more about you? Sure. So me personally, aside from uh, the director at large, as well as uh, somebody who performs regularly with them, I am a higher education administrator. I work at John Jay College during the day. My coworkers know that I do Rocky. They have come <laughs> seen me do Rocky. Uh, my, yeah. stu- my students know that I do Rocky. They have come and seen me <laughs> perform. But I have an Instagram handle. It's John. No, it's not. I changed it. I forgot because I recently started streaming on Twitch. Yes. <laughs> And, uh, of course, I want to make sure that people on Twitch... Brand cohesion, like, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> uh, so it is not m- m- my original. My my Instagram handle is now at Hi John, I'm Dad. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. It's a brand, trust yeah. me. So, yeah, no. <laughs> so, yeah, so I do stream on Twitch. I stream every night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I also stream on Fridays at 10.15 because I watch Drag Race. So that has to take precedence. Yeah. So, yeah, so, but I do stream on Twitch... Uh, every night at 7.30. I'm currently streaming The Last of Us Part 2 right now because it's a fantastic game. But I stream uh, Animal Crossing. I'm going to be streaming Pokemon, uh, the new Persona game, Borderlands, Final Fantasy, pretty much anything that someone throws at me, I stream. Oh, yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, so please go uh, check out NYC or HPS's stuff. Go and check out John's stuff. Um, and go once uh, everybody can come back into theaters again, come pay your local Shadowcast a visit. Absolutely, because we don't get money for doing it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, please, yeah, please just go go support with them with company. your love and yeah. affection and your and your callbacks. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, that was so much fun. Uh, thank you so much again to John, the director at large of the New York City Shadow Cast. Uh, it was so much fun. He's yeah, so cool. John is a lovely, wonderful, kind, beautiful man, and I'm so happy that he uh, came and chatted with us about the Shadowcast experience. And uh, this goes for kind of any uh, Shadowcast too. Is that there's a lot of the big ones, sort of like in big cities, New York and Hollywood and stuff, and the Orlando cast um, that are big and popular, but. See what the closest shadow cast in your area is. And once we can all go to movie theaters again, go and check them out. Um, yeah, for sure. Check them out more than once. They're going to be fun. The shows are usually pretty cheap. I know uh, in New York, I believe it only costs $5 to go see. So 
Which uh, for any movie, that's a steal. Yeah, if you ever have the chance, go and check out a shadow cast. And especially during now when uh, a lot of your favorite shadow casters might be out of work, see what you can do to support them during this time too. But other than that, uh, that's going to do it for us here on The Great American Scream. If you enjoyed this episode or any of our episodes, please be sure to share wherever you get your podcast, be it Spotify or iTunes. If you are on iTunes, leave a rate and review. That really helps us out. But the best way to help us out is to tell a friend about us. Word of mouth is the best form of advertising ever of all time. Adam, please pimp our social medias. Yes, uh, we are on Twitter. You can follow us at Great Scream Pod. And we are also on Facebook at The Great American Scream. Uh, if there's something you'd like us to talk about on the show or you just want to comment on what we talked about, uh, you can tweet at us or post using the hashtag TGAS and make sure to also follow uh, all of uh, NYC RHPS's social media, which is pretty much all at that handle. And go follow John mm-hmm. on Twitch, too. Yeah, for sure. And also go follow me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash D-Law, D-E-E-L-A-W. But I think that'll do it for us. A special thank you goes out to Michael Segudo, who did the intro for this podcast, and to Stevie Viola, who did our theme music. I believe that's it for us. Next week, we'll be talking about comedy in horror, and it'll be a fun time yes, for all. But I've been Devin Wright. I've been Adam O'Connell, and one day we will dance the time warp again. Let's do time warp again Again. safely. Yeah, time warp safely.